Genesis chapter 11, and we'll begin in verse 27. Let's just hear the word of the Lord, shall we? Now, these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Would you just say that phrase with me? And Terah died in Haran. Let, let's go on and, and read with me now, would you? Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his nephew and all their possessions which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Lord, we thank you for your presence, and we ask that you will open our hearts now. I believe you have something to say to us, so let us hear that which the Spirit will say in the midst of the preaching today. I lift up to you other life-giving churches in this city, and I pray blessing upon them. I pray for our loved ones that are not walking in right relationship with you. These names that we've written down and placed on these boards here in the sanctuary, we lift them up to you. Don't let one of them be lost. We pray for our city, O oh Lord. We pray that you will bring a revival, a revival in this church, a revival in this city, a revival that will call people to repentance, a revival that will push back violence and evil, a revival that will establish the glory of the Lord, that your kingdom will come, your will will be done in this place, even as you have already decreed for it to be done in heaven. We thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. One of the things that fairly leaps out at me when I read the stories in the Bible is how often God meets with someone in a significant way and in response to that person's encounter with the Lord, that person builds an altar. The altar serves as a place of worship. The building of an altar serves as an act of gratitude for the grace that has been extended to the person as God has touched them in a significant way. The building of an altar serves almost like an, a, a, a memorial erected to commemorate the event of God's manifestation and the help of His presence. The building of an altar helps to establish the experience the person has had with God when he chose to show up in a unique way in their life. Over the 
last few weeks as I've again embarked on my annual safari reading through the Bible. I've been particularly interested to see the number of altar experiences that are recorded for us in the story of Abraham. Each altar that is erected by Abraham comes at a particularly meaningful point in his journey of faith. Over the next several weeks, I want to visit some of these altars with you because I believe the Holy Spirit has something very powerful to say to us through these places of worship and memorial. He wants to establish in the natural realm something that God has revealed in the spiritual. Abraham, as you know, stands as the first patriarch of the three monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. The passage that we read in chapter 12, those first few verses, we know as the Abrahamic covenant that God makes with this man. When we first meet him, he is called Abram, and we are introduced to him through the genealogy of his father, Terah. A lot of people don't like genealogies, but there are some great lessons we can learn by looking at the family trees that are recorded for us in God's Word. Last Wednesday night in the pastor's Bible study, I talked a little bit about some of the things my family found when we looked at our family tree. <laughs> we discovered there's a few branches on that tree we wish we could trim. You know, sometimes we find things in our heritage we really don't want. It reminds me of the story I heard about one branch of the Smith family. This particular branch, the Smiths were very proud of their family tradition. Their ancestors had come to America on the Mayflower. Their line had included senators, Wall Street wizards, and even some pastors. One day, they decided to compile a family history to leave as a legacy for the children, and they hired a well-known author to write that. In the course of research, one problem arose. How to handle the information about great uncle George. <clears throat> I suppose every family has one of those. You know, someone who's the embarrassment at the family reunion. Great uncle George was such a scoundrel he was finally executed in the electric chair. He was a great blot on the family name, and they didn't know how they were going to deal with him in the book of their family history. But the author reassured them. He said, don't worry. He said, I can handle that section of history tactfully. Finally, the book was completed and was published. And when the family received their copy, they immediately turned to the section on Uncle George. And this is what they read. George Smith occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. <laughs> he was attached to his position by the strongest of ties. <laughs> and his death came as a real shock. <laughs> Well, as we look at the story of Abraham and examine his family tree, we might find some things that come as a real shock. <laughs> Terah is the father of Abram. He is a citizen of Ur of the Chaldeans, where he lives with his family, and it's a wonderful life. They're prosperous, the land is fruitful, everything is grand. Then, according to the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Think about this. <clears throat> right in the midst of a polytheistic society, in the midst of a place that was the center for the worship of a pagan moon god, in the most unlikely place imaginable, the word of the Lord came to Abram and called him to leave his country and go to a land the Lord would show him. 
Now, I just want to interrupt this message right at this point in the very first moments of it to tell you that God can speak to you wherever you are. You don't have to get in a holy place for God to speak to you. You don't have to get everything all taken care of for God to speak to you. God can find, He knows your address. He knows your email address. He knows your phone number. He knows how to get a hold of you. When He wants to touch your life, when He wants to call you, when He wants to speak to you, I'm telling you, the Lord will speak to you. You can be in the midst of committing the most heinous sin, and yet when God says, I want to speak to that person, God will get through to you. And that that just gives me a great deal of assurance right now because it also lets me know that if God can speak to Abram in the midst of that kind of a society and if God can speak to me no matter where I am then that lets me know that God can speak to my loved one no matter where he or she is some of you have been praying and you think that God can't get through to them some of you have been wondering how God was ever going to find your loved one can I just remind you and can I just assure you for a moment God knows where your loved one is and God has not forgotten about your loved one God has not forsaken the one that you care about you care about them but God cares about them even more and God knows exactly what it's going to take in order to get through to them so you trust God and he'll get through to them somebody ought to give praise if you believe that right now If he's got to move heaven and earth, he'll get through to them. Now, just what it was that prompted Terah to accompany Abram. Remember, God spoke to Abram, the Bible says. But what it was that prompted Terah to accompany Abram on this journey, we're never told. It might have something to do with the death of his son in verse 28 of chapter 11. You know, perhaps Terah just couldn't face living in the same place anymore passing the same landmarks going by the same house and he thought if he went somewhere else the grief wouldn't be so intense so maybe it was a form of escape we can relate to that can't we it's possible that while God was speaking to Abram He was also stirring up Terah's nest as well, making him dissatisfied with the the status quo, putting in his spirit a quiet discontent and a restlessness that refused to be satisfied. Yet another possibility is that he decided he didn't want his family to be split up. If Abram was going, then they would all go. Whatever the reason, Terah and all of his family started out to Canaan. Verse 31 tells us they came to a place called Haran, which is about halfway between Ur and Canaan. Instead of just spending the night in Haran and then continuing on their journey, the Bible says they settled there. They put down stakes. They got comfortable. Think about it. God said, he said right up in here, I'm calling you to go to Canaan, but they only got halfway and they settled. They stopped there. And verse 32 is an interesting verse because it says, And Terah died in Haran. I don't want you to miss that. Terah died in Haran. He never reached Canaan. He never achieved the goal. He never realized the vision. Something short-circuited the dream, and he died in Haran. Now, there's a couple of things that just really jump out at me right there when I read those words. First of all, the name of the place where they settled down is Haran. Haran means delay. Second thing that jumps out is, if you look at verse 27 and 28, you discover that the name of Terah's son that died was Haran. Do 
the beginning of the journey held such promise. They started with such excitement, a new place, a new, a fresh start. Now, the trip from Ur to Canaan is about 1,100 miles. And normal caravan pace is about 20 or 10 to 20 miles per day. By the time they arrive in Haran, they're only at the halfway mark. So the journey up to now, it's taken them a couple of months or so. It's been long. It's been arduous. It's taken a lot longer than they expected. The enthusiasm drained out about three exits ago. Day after day of the same landscape, the same routine, everything the same. How many of you know that will wear on you? And now they arrive at Haran and they are hit with a wave of nostalgia because it reminds them of home. They worship the same gods here in Haran just like they did back in Ur. Same moon god. And the name of the place, oh, it calls to mind the boy that died much too young. I don't imagine they suddenly decided, hey, we're just going to stay here. It was only supposed to be a short rest before resuming their trip. But one day bled into the next. It was just too comfortable. It was too easy. And they were surrounded by the familiar. Every time they said the name of the place, they thought of their deceased relative. There wasn't the urgency they felt when they began. When they thought of the hardships they had already endured, it just seemed like too much hassle to pack everything up again can I just tell you when you're in delay it's easy to forget the goal when you're in delay it's easy to have the vision clouded when you're in delay it's easy to rationalize the complacency when you're in delay it's easy to lose the urgency and how many of you recognize that I'm not just talking about Tara and Abram right now when I'm talking about this? See, God has determined to bless you just as surely as he decided he was going to bless Abram. Blessing has to do with being in favor with God and under his protection and care. That's what blessing is. Does that, does that sound like anything anybody would like to have today? I don't know anybody that wouldn't want the blessing of God on their life. Let me tell you something about blessing. Obedience is the path to blessing. Say that with me, would you? Obedience is the path to blessing. And I'll tell you something else. Delayed obedience is disobedience. When you step out in obedience, you needn't think that the blessing will immediately follow. See, we think all we have to do is push in the right numbers, hit enter, and the vending machine drops it out for us. That's not the way it works. Between the time of your obedience and the time of receiving the blessing, you will often walk through a no man's land of monotonous routine in which you will be tempted to turn aside for something that is a little more exciting. Something that is a little more familiar. Something that is a little more comfortable. Something that is a little more in keeping with your preconceived plan. When you're in delay, you aren't denying the call of God. You aren't dismissing what you know God wants from you. You're just putting it off until you can see your way clear. You're just waiting until you can get a few things worked out. You're just holding back until you can figure out the best way. And when you do that, you're leaving God and His miraculous out of the equation. You're acting like you are capable of producing the blessing by yourself. You're trusting the arm of flesh rather than the Spirit of God. God has called some of you that are listening to this message to a new place of trusting Him with your finances and your delay is killing your blessing. God has called some of you to trust Him with your relationships 
and your delay trying to work it out by your own methods, it's killing your blessing. God has called some of you to a fresh surrender of the control of your life to Him. And your delay, rationalizing your behavior, thinking you can somehow get your life back together on your own, it's killing your blessing. Delay is the enemy of blessing. Delay is a dream killer. Delay is a destiny destroyer. Don't get trapped in delay. Don't settle down in delay. We don't know just how long Abram languished with his family in delay. But we do know in chapter 12, the Lord spoke to him. Stirred him out of his complacency and called him to a place of destiny. Look at it again in chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. The Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you. I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You know, sometimes we think that obeying God is going to cause us to lose out. Sometimes we think if we make a full surrender of our lives to God, we're going to miss out on something, that, that the cost is just too great. I want you to notice here that God does not ask Abram to give up anything he is not going to replace. Abram is asked to leave his land, and God promises to take him to a new land. And after he arrives in that new land, God says, I'm going to give you that land. Abram is asked to leave his kinship group. This means giving up the protection and the security that a kinship group provides. He's leaving his roots. He's putting aside all that is familiar to him. In return... He has offered a family that will become a great nation, so great that he is later told that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars. Abram must also leave behind his father's household. This is his inheritance. This call is to leave his ancestors' faith. This is a call to trust God and God alone in a way that nobody in his family has ever done. The inheritance one received included not only material possessions and ownership of land, but also included taking one's place in the family line and appropriating the blessings that had been passed down through the family line. As Abram puts all of this behind him in obedience to the call of God, God offers a threefold blessing to Abram. God will bless him. Abram will be a blessing. Abram will be a channel of blessing. This means Abram will come under God's care, protection, and favor. This will bring him safety and prosperity. It means that Abram will be in a position to provide care and protection to those in favor with him. It means that God will bring blessing to other people through Abram and his family and that God will use Abram and his family as an example to show what happens when God chooses to bless someone. God has, as an act of his divine grace, singled Abram out from every other person on the earth and decided to bless him. In response to the call and the promise of God, Abram, the Bible says, believed and he demonstrated his faith and embraced the promise by his actions. We see his response when he arrives at Shechem in the land of Canaan in verses 6 and 7. I want you to notice those again. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. That's an important statement. Don't miss that. I'll tell you why in a moment. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So what does Abram do? He built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. The building of an altar had multiple purposes. Certainly it was an act of worship. We would automatically think of that. 
It was an acknowledgement that there was a divine connection. But the building of an altar was also a way of establishing a claim on the land. In the building of this altar, Abram is sealing his assent to the word of the Lord. He's making a claim on the land that God has promised. He's making a claim on the promise of God. The building of this altar was an act of consecration on Abram's part. A means of setting himself apart for a divine purpose and destiny. God gave the word... And Abram said, Amen, in the building of an altar. God promised, and Abram came into agreement in the building of an altar. God spoke, and the proclamation of the Spirit was established in the natural by the building of an altar. Now watch this. What makes this such a remarkable act is that the promise is given, and the promise is believed while there is nothing in the natural that is visible to suggest that the fulfillment of the promise is even remotely possible. God said, Abram, come follow me and I'm going to make you a great nation. But verse 30 of chapter 11, here it is, makes it very plain. Abram's wife is barren. I, I, God said, Abram, I'm going to give you land. But Abram left his inheritance. He abandoned all rights and claims to the land of his family. God said, I'm going to make you a blessing to families. But Abram is far removed from his kinsmen with no hope that he could see of starting a new family. He has given up all the protection and security that was provided in his father's house. He's left his roots and put aside all that was familiar. God said, I'm going to bless you in an abundant measure. But Abram was in the midst of a cruel, barbaric people known as the Canaanites. Remember I said, remember that statement? The Canaanite was then in the land. Don't miss that. They were cruel and barbaric. They were going to do everything in their power to inhibit and prevent the fulfillment of the promise of God in the life of Abram. In spite of everything that argued against it, Abram came into agreement with the promise of God and built an altar. In that act, he was declaring his own inability and relying upon the capability of an almighty God. In that act of building an altar, Abram was saying, God, I trust you. I trust you. The only way I can ever be a great nation is if you do something about the barren condition of my wife. But you're God. You're able. You've promised. So I'm going to let you figure out how to accomplish it. And I'm just going to be obedient and worship you. The only way I can ever possess the land is if you bring it to pass. I didn't ask to come here. I didn't even know where you were leading me when you called me. I didn't have any of this in mind when I started out from Ur of the Chaldeans. But I trust you. You're able. You've promised. So I'm going to let you figure out how to accomplish it. And I'm just going to be obedient and worship you. God, I'm in the midst of a vicious people. They will surely destroy me and my little band of servants and family. I don't know how you're ever going to cause me to displace them. But you're able. You've promised. So I'm going to let you figure out how to accomplish it. I'm just going to be obedient and worship you. <laughs> Abram realized that the only way any of the promises of God would come to his life would be through the powerful grace of the Almighty at work. His response was not to try to figure it out, but to seal it at an altar. A place of sacrifice, a place of surrender, a place of affirmation, a place of establishing a claim upon the promise God had made. That's why the Apostle Paul could write in Romans chapter 4 verses 19 through 22. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, 
he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore also it was reckoned to him as righteousness." in spite of all the obstacles and adversities that argued against its fulfillment, Abram sealed the promise of God to his life. He secured it in faith at an altar. God said it. That was enough. Now, I'm ready to preach. That's my introduction. You need the story so you can hear what God is saying. Because as I was preparing this message, it's, it's not going to take me long to tell you this. I don't have three points and an illustration. I don't have uh, uh, an alliteration today. All I have is what I believe God has given me as His Word for the people that would hear this message today. As I was preparing, I had the feeling that I would be, pe would be preaching to some people of promise. I'm talking right now to some people of destiny. You may not have thought of yourself that way, but you are. You're the people of God. Once you were not even a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. You're the people of destiny. I'm talking to some people. You have heard the voice of the master saying, I want you to come to a place you've never been before. Come to a place in me you've never been before. It's a place of blessing. It's a place of refreshing. It's a place of new anointing. It's a place of spiritual growth and maturity. It's a place of revelation. It's a place of productivity. It's a place of influence. It's a place of opportunity. It's your spiritual Canaan to which God is calling you today. It's that place of nearness and intimacy with the Heavenly Father. It's that place where you can feel His heartbeat. And hear his voice and know him not just for the things he has done, for his acts, but you can know him for his ways and for who he is. It's a different dimension from that of, that most people know anything about. It's a place of worship. It's a place of delight in his presence. It's a place where you begin to breathe the rarefied air of his holiness and his glory. Some of you had started moving to that place. Some of you were making great strides, but you settled down in the land of delay. You got distracted. Life started caving in on you. And, and then you got comfortable. You listened to the negative voices around you saying, you don't need to be quite so radical about this thing. You pulled back. Because of family and friends and peers. You got alarmed at all you were going to have to give up. And all the sacrifices you'd have to make. In order to completely follow the call of the Lord. Some of you have been in the land of delay for so long. That the call and the promise of God seems like a distant memory. The longer you stay there, the fainter it grows. And the more it's killing your spirit. So this is your wake-up call today. The call of God, the promise of God, it's still there. Lingering in the land of delay will kill the dream and rob you of your destiny. So won't you hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you once again? He's calling, shake off the lethargy. He's calling, return to the first love relationship you once had with me. He's calling, come back to the place of sweet fellowship. He's calling, Come back to the place of surrender. Come back to the place of consecration. He's calling, come to a place that I will show you. A place of blessing beyond anything you ever dreamed. There are others listening to this message who have heard the voice of promise. But there seem to be so many obstacles and so many reasons why it could never happen. Everything in the natural argues against it. 
God has spoken His Word. He has given a promise. He's indicated a potential He intends to multiply and prosper through you. He has decreed His blessing for your life. He has proclaimed His provision of wholeness for you. He's promised a future and a hope. He's spoken a word of life into that place of barrenness. He's caused a spark of hope to ignite in your heart. But every time you look around you, all you can see are the obstacles and opposition that seek to keep you away from the purposes of God. All you can hear are the vicious adversaries that try to drown out His voice. All you can think is, what if He doesn't come through? It's in the midst of that kind of struggle that you can silence the discouraging voices you can combat the negatives. You can rewrite the program of doubt when you build an altar. Seal the promise of God at an altar. Secure the promise of God in faithful obedience at an altar. Sure, the adversary's resistance is real. How many of you know that's true? You can expect your dreams to be attacked. You can expect your destiny to be challenged. But what is fixed at an altar of obedience to God will find solidity when it later comes under attack. What is sealed at the Father's throne will survive and triumph. This is where an altar of obedience becomes an altar of blessing. When you're waiting on the fulfillment of the promise, trust His Word and build an altar. When the dream hasn't been realized, trust His Word and build an altar. When the vision hasn't materialized, trust His Word and build an altar. When the goal hasn't been achieved, trust His Word and build an altar. When it looks like all the forces of hell are against you, trust His Word and build an altar. When you want to press in to the heart of God, trust His Word and build an altar. When you want to experience the glory of His presence, trust His Word and build an altar. I'm telling you, in the midst of doubt, build an altar. In the midst of despair, build an altar. In the midst of adversity, Build an altar. In the midst of persecution, you got it. Build an altar. In the midst of weakness, build an altar. In the midst of confusion, build an altar. In the midst of oppression, build an altar. You have His promise today. It's a promise of victory. It's a promise of help. It's a promise of strength. It's a promise of fulfillment. It's a promise of power. It's a promise of accomplishment. It's a promise of triumph it's a promise of blessing so seal the promise of God to your life trust his word obey his word build an altar let's pray Lord I've delivered the word that you've given me I've delivered my heart and my soul in this message but only you Holy Spirit can can affect any kind of change in our lives. It just, it's nothing more than words unless you do something about it. So that's what I'm praying for today. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you will get in the mix now, that you will touch the hearts of the people who have listened to this message, and that you will make it real and make it come alive in our hearts. It's the only way it works. I need you, Lord. We need you. While our heads are bowed for a moment. It's entirely possible that I'm preaching to somebody that the call of the Lord to you today is come out of your err. Come out of that place that is godless. Come out of that place where you're looking to any and everything except the Lord. Come out of that place where you are ignoring God. 
Come out of that place where you're living for yourself and not for God. Come out of Ur. Come over into the land of promise. God's calling somebody today to surrender your life to Jesus. If you've never done that before, you don't need a sign, you don't need a feeling. All you need is a decision. Today, I'm coming out of that. I'm not going to dwell in that land of godlessness anymore. I'm not going to dwell in unrighteousness anymore. I'm coming out so that I can get to my place of blessing. The way to do that is just simply in the quietness of your own heart, you look to Jesus and you say, Jesus, forgive me. I've been going my way, not God's way. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse my life. Change me from the inside out. I don't want to I don't want to get stuck over here in a godless land. I don't want to be lost without God and His Son. Save me today, I pray. If you prayed that in your heart, believe it with your heart. The promise of God is that anyone that comes to Him, He will not turn aside. But he will welcome you with open arms and receive you unto Himself. There's a second invitation that I believe the Lord wants to extend. Not just to those who are still in Ur to come out to a land of promise, but there's some folks that are in Haran right now. You're in delay. You're just caught halfway between. You're not in that godless land anymore, but you haven't really stepped over into the promises of God yet either. You've just kind of settled down and you're going through the motions, you're going through the routine. If anybody were to come and ask you, you'd say, oh yes, I'm a believer. Oh yes, I'm a Christian. I want to ask you, are you really acting like a Christian? Are you living like a Christian? See, Jesus told us how we would know those that were His. Because we would keep His commandments. We would obey Him. We would follow Him with our whole heart. Nothing left back. Nothing held in reserve. Some of you are in Haran. You're you're in that place of delay. You're in that place of, well, it's okay. I'm comfortable, you know. I do the church thing. I come to church, you know, when something else doesn't interfere with it. And, uh, And I'm a good person, whatever that means. And, you know, I, maybe I even, maybe I even give my tithe and offering. I can quote a few Bible verses. And I know the right things to say. And, and, and I even know how to pray. Now, whether I actually pray or not is a, it may be a different story. But, but yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not resistant to God. But you are resistant to full obedience to Him. Because you're living in Haran. You're living in that place of the familiar, the comfortable. Where you don't, you're, you're not having to step out in faith. It doesn't take any faith to live in Haran. It takes a lot of faith to step over to go where you don't know where God's leading you and you won't know it until He gets you there. But oh, what an adventure that is. And oh, the blessing that comes when you actually do that. Beyond your wildest imagination, God blesses. God helps. Some of you need to come out of Haran. The call of God. He's got me preaching this sermon to this church. Because he wants to bring us as a church out of Haran into a new place, a new dimension of his grace and glory that he's prepared for us. A new place of his favor, a new place of his blessing. Father, I'm praying for those people now in the quietness of their heart. They're saying, yes, that's me. I've just kind of gotten settled in and gotten comfortable and nothing's really, really, nothing's really moving me anymore. Forgive me, Lord. dwelling in Haran is killing my spiritual life. I'm not as passionate for you as I used to be. I'm not as committed to you as I used to be. I'm not as consecrated as I used to be. I'm not not as interested in things of God as I used to be. So forgive me, Lord, and bring me back. Welcome me back.
to that first love relationship with you. I thank you for doing that. I thank you in Jesus' name. I thank you in Jesus' name. Stand with me, please. If you prayed a prayer of surrender of your life to Jesus with me for the very first time in that invitation, in the back of the seat, there's a blue card. If you take that card and just fill in the information on the back, it's just some contact information. Take it to the information desk in the lobby. Hand it to the person there. I have a book I want to give you to get you started in your walk with the Lord. And somebody this week will contact you and pray with you. We want to help you. We want, we want to... We want to establish what God is doing in your life in this service this morning. We want to believe that God's going to transform your life from the inside out and bring you into a place of blessing that He has for you. Before we go now, I've got one more thing I want to invite you to do. If you're here today and you say, Pastor John, I just need God's touch on my life. I need His help. There's something going on and I need prayer. I don't care what it's for. You're here and you want and need prayer. Step out of your seat. Come stand here in the front. We're going to pray for you and we're going to believe that God's going to touch you today. I'm not going to beg you. I'm not going to wait long. If you want prayer, you know you need it. You know you want it. You come now. Anybody at all? Three. Yes. Anybody else? else thank you Jesus somebody lift your hand lift your hands toward this person let's pray Jesus you see the need and you understand the desire of his heart you know what's going on you know when nobody else knows so touch him I pray bring your help bring your presence fill his life with your peace and with your power I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you hear the cry of our heart. You will hear our prayer. And you've promised before we call, you will answer. So bring it to his life, Jesus. And I thank you for it. I thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I feel your touch right now, Holy Spirit. I believe you for your presence. I believe you for your work now. Come on, give God some praise in this house. Praise Him like you believe God is at work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We establish your work at an altar right now, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We make this declaration of root. My time's up. Let's do it committed to the great commandment, committed to the great commission, committed to the great community. I am Restoration Church. Thanks for being here. I want to see you back at 5 o'clock for prayer. God is up to something. Don't miss what God is doing. Receive this benediction before you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you cause His face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May He lift His countenance upon you. May the peace of God be yours, my child. You are the blessed of the Lord. I love you, and I'm believing that God has a blessing for your life this week. Go in His grace.